It was just another routine mission for the 99th Pursuit Squadron in August 1944. Like the day before, 2nd Lieutenant Richard Macon, who just joined his fighter group six months earlier, was headed out over France. The target? Radar stations off the coast. As Macon made his approach, it was anything but routine. And he soon found himself facing a fighter pilot's worst nightmare, a German firing squad. Richard graduated from Miles College in Fairfield, Alabama, armed with a degree in mathematics. But solving equations would have to wait. The U.S. had just entered the war, and a wave of patriotic fever swept across the nation, compelling both men and women to step forward. Despite the pervasive racism and systematic segregation in the country, many black Americans were determined to step up and serve their nation proudly. For them, this was home, and their sense of honor and duty stood tall. Richard felt no different. In a sense, he knew his bravery could help him fight racism on both fronts. He set his sights on the Army Air Corps, fulfilling a lifelong dream of flying. The 99th had just formed officially a few months earlier. And in 1943, he headed out to the Tuskegee Airfield, home of the 332nd Fighter Group, on a train ride that would change his life. When I got the orders to leave and go into service, finally, uh, I got uh, a Pullman ticket. And uh, no one had ever known any black person to leave Birmingham, Alabama in Pullman. When I got on the train, of course, the conductor says, no, you sit in the front. And I says, no, if I get on this train, I, take, I sit at Pullman, and if I don't get on the Pullman, the president will know about it. Before the war broke out, it took the bravery and determination of many black pioneers to prove that blacks could fly, thanks to an old 1920 War Department report claiming that they didn't have the intelligence. Pioneers like Chauncey Spencer and Dale White, who flew from Chicago to D.C. in a rented Lincoln PTK, you could swear was held together by chewing gum and toothpicks, to convince Congress to pass the civil pilot training program. Or Yancey Williams, who had to file a discrimination lawsuit after the Air Corps wouldn't let him join in 1941, forcing the government's hand to create the 99th Pursuit Squadron at the Tuskegee Institute. They called this the noble experiment when there were so many black pilots already flying, doing stunt flying and all other kinds of flying, and Congress still had a problem with whether blacks could learn how to fly. Once Macon arrived at Tuskegee, he found he wasn't the only one with a college degree. Many of his fellow candidates were doctors, lawyers, and college graduates like himself. That put him at ease and was a far cry from the idea that they didn't have the intelligence to fly. Since we were all forced together under very unusual, when you think about the humanity of all men, unusual circumstances, all of the black pilots were trained at Tuskegee and uh, they were trained by white pilots because the government, for some reason, couldn't find any black pilots who were uh, capable of doing this. After we passed through primary, of course, I had black pilot instructors in primary, but for the rest of the way, whites trained us because they were in the, uh, the Air Corps and there were no blacks in the, in the Air Corps to train us. So, uh, that pushed us much closer together. I would say that uh, there was a greater camaraderie among us pilots than I've ever experienced among the Alpha Phi Alpha fraternity members. With his resolve firm, Richard dedicated himself entirely to earning his wings, fully aware of the difficult journey ahead. 
the stringent regulations imposed on black pilots left no margin for error, far stricter than those faced by their white counterparts. But this did not stop him from realizing his dream. I first flew in an airplane. It was the most exhilarating feeling that I can ever think of because now I'm going to make my wishes come true. And I was in love with the airplane before I ever got into it. In primary, you go through three phases of training. After pre-flight, you go to primary where you fly a bi-wing airplane. It was called at that time the PT-17. And then when you finish there, you go to basic, uh, where we fly an airplane that is called the Volte Vibrator. We gave it the name Vibrator because uh, as it approaches a stall, the wings, you can see wrinkles in the wings because it's vibrating so. And once you left uh, basic and got through there, you flew the AT-6, which was advanced training. That's what the AT stands for, advanced training. And uh, from there, you go into a fighter aircraft. So it was exciting, pure exciting. The fighter aircraft assigned to Tuskegee was a double-edged sword for Macon and the men. The War Department gave the group the P-40 Warhawk. For one, it was amazingly agile at low altitudes, but sluggish at higher elevations. This wasn't a big confidence boost for the cadets, who could face the more formidable ME-109 overseas. Nonetheless, Richard graduated on February 8, 1944. Out of the 1,600 who joined Tuskegee, only 992 made it, and 2nd Lieutenant Richard Macon was one of them. Soon, he got the order to deploy overseas as part of the 302nd Fighter Group. His destination? Italy. Well, when I got overseas, I began to realize that uh, all of the other things, all of the other things that I had done, were done to prepare me for this, because now this is a real thing. The next voice I hear may be that of the enemy. That's a funny feeling. I don't know whether all soldiers feel this way, but I began to feel from now on, it's for keeps. When Richard arrived on the other side of the world, he found to his excitement and surprise that the 302nd was assigned the P-51 Mustang. This was top shelf. He relished the airplane and knew he had the upper hand in combat. The 302nd's mission included flying bomber escorts, rescue, and one of the more dangerous missions, strafing targets. Richard enjoyed flying the Mustang, and this was his chance, as he put it, to outfly the Germans and shoot them down. This mission would take him the farthest he'd ever flown, from Ramatelli Airfield to Toulon, France, a far trek even for the P-51. The purpose of our mission was to destroy radar equipment so that Patton's army could land uh, with, this, with the least amount of opposition from, from Germans uh, uh, on the French coast. We had to go in and shoot down these targets, and we knew that there was very little protection for those. At least that's what intelligence told us. So we used the usual maneuvers, fly high like we were going some other place, and then drop down behind the mountains where the radar couldn't pick us up, and then dash in from behind the mountains, and before the gunners could get to their guns, we'd be gone. It didn't happen like that. When we dashed down to hit the target, it looked like 4th of July. They shot up a wall of fire. When you ran through the wall, fire, you were hit by several bullets. That you just ran into, you just collided with those bullets. Uh, my buddy on the right was uh, Joe Gordon, and uh, he ran into a shower of those bullets. 
And his plane exploded. It exploded like a clay pigeon. There was nothing left but just a little puff of smoke. Pieces flew everywhere, but that's all. First thing you do when that happens is feel good that it wasn't you. The next thing you do is to say, I got to go down and get those SLBs. I started down to get them when I noticed that my wing had been wrapped on the right side. The controls had been shot, had been broken by some one of the bullets. And the plane flipped over upside down. And I tried to ride it up, straight up again, but uh, I had no control over the aircraft with the controls. So I started going through the motions of getting out, even though I knew it was, it was useless because I was going so fast and was so close to the ground. But I started anyway. The plane was upside down, and all of a sudden I read it out. When I regained consciousness on the ground, it was about, an, I looked at my watch, it was about an hour after we were over the target. So I suspected I was unconscious for about the greater part of an hour. And uh, I started to get up to run someplace, to bury my parachute like you're supposed to do and run someplace. Uh, but uh, when I started trying to get up, I found out I couldn't move. And at that point, I was unconscious again. When I began consciousness again, the German said, Rausmitten. I didn't have to know German to know that they must have been saying, get on your feet. Richard found himself paralyzed from the waist down. His shoulder was banged up pretty badly. He didn't even realize his neck was broken, causing him to pass out. So the Germans had to carry him. Later, without any real medical attention, things took a turn, and Richard was about to face one of the darkest days of his life. The Germans uh, found out that uh, the man whose plane crashed into the building and killed about 35 or 40 Germans who were in this building, it was, it was like a headquarters building, uh, that he had been captured and was held over there in this schoolhouse. So the next night they came over to get me, to take me, to shoot me as a hostage. I was blindfolded and they were taking me up since I couldn't walk. My feet were sliding, I was dragging on the ground. And they managed to get me propped up at a place along the wall. And uh, then someone gave a command and I could hear soldiers marching and cadence. And someone gave another command and I could hear them stop. And they gave a facing command and I heard, I could hear them shh, pop, pop, the way the Germans do when they do the right face. And then the strange thing is, at that point, I was happy that they were going to kill me because then I wouldn't have to suffer all of the additional pain added to what I had already suffered because of my injuries. And this would get me out of all of this, and I was glad. So they gave the order. In America, in English, it would be, ready, aim, fire. Ready. Aim. And I, I figured by that time, they were looking at me down the gun barrel. And then this big gate back there opened, and there was a noise. I knew the gate opened because I had heard the noise when they brought me in. And somebody called attention. And you could hear heels popping all over the place. And then there was conversation down near the gate. I could hear, I could see where I could hear. And they were shouting. And I heard the name Macon. Hauptmann Macon. I was and uh, they uh, had sent, the Germans had sent this German Hauptmann down, to, to captain down to pick me up, to interrogate me, to find out what was going on. 
because the war was being fight up by, was being fought by the Bulgars. The Bulge was the Ardennes offensive, and because Hitler was planning a counterattack, the Germans believed that Macon could still prove to be useful. Hitler's plan later became known as the Battle of the Bulge. It was a futile attempt to turn the tide of the war. Some say it may have been more of a political move on Hitler's part, since he was shell-shocked by one of the more than 40 attempts on his life. You see, a month before Macon flew his mission, Hitler had just survived Operation Valkyrie. Richard was taken to a field hospital where he met up with fellow pilots Alex Jefferson and Robert H. Daniels. They saw he was in bad shape, but before doctors could set his neck, the Allies had advanced and forced the hospital to move. A few days later, he arrived at Stalag Luft III, where his neck was finally set. Because the Allies were advancing fast, Richard was moved to several prison camps before ending up in Moosburg, Germany, where he would remain until the end of the war. Second Lieutenant Richard D. Macon was promoted to captain for his acts of heroism, and for his injuries, he received an Air Medal and a Purple Heart. After the war, Captain Macon was determined to pass on his love for flying and set up a flight school at Birmingham Airport in Alabama. He had orchestrated a once-in-a-lifetime meeting with none other than aviation tycoon Howard Hughes, who owned several hangars there. Hughes was impressed with Macon's passion and vision and let him use one of his hangars free of charge. Later, he returned to his mathematical roots and earned a master's degree at Indiana University, eventually returning to his alma mater as an associate professor. In 1956, he transitioned to teaching in the Detroit public schools. After his retirement in 1987, he founded Tuskegee Airmen Inc. with his friend and fellow squad mate, Alex Jefferson. He died in 2007 and is buried in Arlington National Cemetery with full honors. Captain Macon's heroic and extraordinary journey to overcome incredible odds is a testament to the pride and bravery of the 332nd Fighter Group, the Lonely Eagles, Airmen of Tuskegee.